Chapter thirty six of Far from the Madding Crowd. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter thirty six. Wealth in Jeopardy. The Revel. One night at the end of August, when Bathsheba's experiences as a married woman were still new, and when the weather was yet dry and sultry, a man stood motionless in the stockyard of Weatherbury Upper Farm, looking at the moon and sky. The night had a sinister aspect. A heated breeze from the south slowly fanned the summits of lofty objects, and in the sky dashes of buoyant cloud were sailing in a course at right angles to that of another stratum, neither of them in the direction of the breeze below. The moon, as seen through these films, had a lurid metallic look. The fields were sallow with the impure light, and all were tinged in monochrome, as if beheld through stained glass. The same evening the sheep had trailed homeward head to tail, the behaviour of the rooks had been confused, and the horses had moved with timidity and caution. Thunder was imminent, and, taking some secondary appearances into consideration, it was likely to be followed by one of the lengthened rains which marked the close of dry weather for the season. Before twelve hours had passed, a harvest atmosphere would be a bygone thing. Oak gazed with misgiving at eight naked and unprotected ricks, massive and heavy with the rich produce of one half of the farm for that year. He went on to the barn. This was the night which had been selected by Sergeant Troy, ruling now in the room of his wife, for giving the harvest supper and dance. As Oak approached the building the sound of violins and a tambourine, and the regular jigging of many feet, grew more distinct. He came close to the large doors, one of which stood slightly ajar, and looked in. The central space, together with the recess at one end, was emptied of all encumbrances, and this area, covering about two-thirds of the whole, was appropriated for the gathering, the remaining end, which was piled to the ceiling with oats, being screened off with sail-cloth. Tufts and garlands of green foliage decorated the walls, beams, and extemporized chandeliers, and immediately opposite to oak a rostrum had been erected, bearing a table and chairs. Here sat three fiddlers, and beside them stood a frantic man with his hair on end, perspiration streaming down his cheeks, and a tambourine quivering in his hand. The dance ended, and on the black oak floor in the midst a new row of couples formed for another. "'Now, ma'am, and no offence, I hope, I ask what dance you would like next,' said the first violin. "'Really, it makes no difference.' said the clear voice of Bathsheba, who stood at the inner end of the building, observing the scene from behind a table covered with cups and viands. Troy was lolling beside her. "'Then,' said the fiddler, "'I'll venture to name that the right and proper thing is the soldier's joy. There being a gallant soldier married into the farm, eight my sonnies and gentlemen all?' "'It shall be the soldier's joy!' exclaimed the chorus. "'Thanks for the compliment.' said the sergeant gaily, taking Bathsheba by the hand and leading her to the top of the dance. For, though I have purchased my discharge from Her Most Gracious Majesty's Regiment of Cavalry, the Eleventh Dragoon Guards, to attend to the new duties awaiting me here, I shall continue a soldier in spirit and feeling as long as I live. So the dance began. As to the merits of the soldier's joy, there cannot be, and never were, two opinions. It has been observed in the musical circles of Weatherbury and its vicinity that this melody, at the end of three-quarters of an hour of thunderous footing, still possesses more stimulative properties for the heel and toe than the majority of other dances at their first opening. The soldier's joy has, too, an additional charm in being so admirably adapted to the tambourine aforesaid, no mean instrument in the hands of a performer who understands the proper convulsions, spasms, St. Vitus's dances and fearful frenzies necessary when exhibiting its tones in their highest perfection. The immortal tune ended, a fine D-D -d rolling forth from the bass viol, with the sonorousness of a cannonade. 
and Gabriel delayed his entry no longer. He avoided Bathsheba, and got as near as possible to the platform where Sergeant Troy was now seated, drinking brandy and water, though the others drank without exception cider and ale. Gabriel could not easily thrust himself within speaking distance of the sergeant, and he sent a message, asking him to come down for a moment. The sergeant said he could not attend. "'Will you tell him, then,' said Gabriel, "'that I only stepped at heart to say that a heavy rain is sure to fall soon, and that something shall be done to protect the ricks.' "'Mr. Troy says it will not rain,' returned the messenger, "'and he cannot stop to talk to you about such fidgets.' In juxtaposition with Troy, Oak had a melancholy tendency to look like a candle beside gas, and ill at ease he went out again, thinking he would go home, for under the circumstances he had no heart for the scene in the barn. At the door he paused for a moment. Troy was speaking. "'Friends, it is not only the harvest home that we are celebrating to-night, but this is also a wedding feast.' A short time ago I had the happiness to lead to the altar this lady, your mistress, and not until now have we been able to give any public flourish to the event in Weatherbury. That it might be thoroughly well done, and that every man may go happy to bed, I have ordered to be brought here some bottles of brandy and kettles of hot water. A treble strong goblet will be handed round to each guest. Bathsheba put her hand upon his arm, and with upturned pale face said imploringly, "'No, don't give it to them. Pray don't, Frank. It will only do them harm. They have had enough of everything.' "'True. We don't wish for no more, thank ye,' said one or two. "'Pooh!' said the sergeant contemptuously, and raised his voice as if lighted up by a new idea. "'Friends,' he said, "'we'll send the women folk home. Tis time they were in bed. Then we cockbirds will have a jolly carouse to ourselves.' If any of the men show a white feather, let them look elsewhere for a winter's work." Bathsheba indignantly left the barn, followed by all the women and children. The musicians, not looking upon themselves as company, slipped quietly away to their spring wagon, and put in the horse. Thus Troy and the men of the farm were left sole occupants of the place. Oak, not to appear unnecessarily disagreeable, stayed a little while. Then he too arose and quietly took his departure, followed by a friendly oath from the sergeant for not staying to a second round of grog. Gabriel proceeded towards his home. In approaching the door his toe kicked something which felt and sounded soft, leathery, and distended, like a boxing-glove. It was a large toad humbly travelling across the path. Oak took it up, thinking it might be better to kill the creature to save it from pain, but finding it uninjured he placed it again among the grass. He knew what this direct message from the great mother meant, and soon came another. When he struck a light indoors there appeared upon the table a thin glistening streak, as if a brush of varnish had been lightly dragged across it. Oak's eyes followed the serpentine sheen to the other side, where it led up to a huge brown garden slug, which had come indoors to-night for reasons of its own. It was nature's second way of hinting to him that he was to prepare for foul weather. Oak sat down meditating for nearly an hour. During this time two black spiders, of the kind common in thatched houses, promenaded the ceiling, ultimately dropping to the floor. This reminded him that if there was one class of manifestation on this matter that he thoroughly understood, it was the instincts of sheep. He left the room, ran across two or three fields towards the flock, got upon a hedge, and looked over among them. They were crowded close together on the other side, around some furze bushes, and the first peculiarity observable was that, on the sudden appearance of Oak's head over the fence, they did not stir or run away. They had now a terror of something greater than their terror of man. But this was not the most noteworthy feature. They were all grouped in such a way that their tails, without a single exception, were towards that half of the horizon from which the storm threatened. There was an inner circle, closely huddled, and outside these they radiated wider apart, the pattern formed by the flock as a whole not being unlike a Van Dyked lace collar to which the clump of furze-bushes stood in the position of a wearer's neck. 
This was enough to re-establish him in his original opinion. He knew now that he was right, and that Troy was wrong. Every voice in nature was unanimous in bespeaking change, but two distinct translations attached to these dumb expressions. Apparently there was to be a thunderstorm, and afterwards a cold, continuous rain. The creeping things seemed to know all about the later rain, but little of the interpolated thunderstorm, whilst the sheep knew all about the thunderstorm and nothing of the later rain. This complication of weathers being uncommon was all the more to be feared. Oak returned to the stackyard. All was silent there, and the conical tips of the ricks jutted darkly into the sky. There were five wheat ricks in this yard, and three stacks of barley. The wheat, when threshed, would average about thirty quarters to each stack, the barley at least forty. Their value to Bathsheba, and indeed to anybody, Oak mentally estimated by the following simple calculation. Five multiplied by thirty equals one hundred and fifty quarters equals five hundred pounds. Three multiplied by forty equals one hundred and twenty quarters equals two hundred and fifty pounds. Total seven hundred and fifty pounds. Seven hundred and fifty pounds in the divinest form that money can wear, that of necessary food for man and beast. Should the risk be run of deteriorating this bulk of corn to less than half its value, because of the instability of a woman? Never, if I can prevent it, said Gabriel. Such was the argument that Oak set outwardly before him. But man, even to himself, is a palimpsest, having an ostensible writing, and another beneath the lines. It is possible that there was this golden legend under the utilitarian one. I will help to my last effort the woman I have loved so dearly. He went back to the barn to endeavour to obtain assistance for covering the ricks that very night. All was silent within, and he would have passed on in the belief that the party had broken up, had not a dim light, yellow as saffron by contrast with the greenish whiteness outside, streamed through a knot-hole in the folding doors. Gabriel looked in. An unusual picture met his eye. The candles suspended among the evergreens had burnt down to their sockets and in some cases the leaves tied about them were scorched. Many of the lights had quite gone out, others smoked and stank, grease dropping from them upon the floor. Here, under the table, and leaning against forms and chairs in every conceivable attitude, except the perpendicular, were the wretched persons of all the workfolk, the hair of their heads at such low levels being suggestive of mops and brooms. In the midst of these shone red and distinct the figure of Sergeant Troy, leaning back in a chair. Coggan was on his back, with his mouth open, buzzing forth snores, as were several others. The united breathings of the horizontal assemblage forming a subdued roar, like London from a distance. Joseph Poorgrass was curled round in the fashion of a hedgehog, apparently in attempts to present the least possible portion of a surface to the air and behind him was dimly visible an unimportant remnant of William Smallbury. The glasses and cups still stood upon the table, a water-jug being overturned, from which a small rill, after tracing its course with marvellous precision down the centre of the long table, fell into the neck of the unconscious Mark Clark, in a steady, monotonous drip, like the dripping of a stalactite in a cave. Gabriel glanced hopelessly at the group, which, with one or two exceptions, composed all the able-bodied men upon the farm. He saw at once that if the ricks were to be saved that night, or even the next morning, he must save them with his own hands. A faint ting-ting resounded from under Coggan's waistcoat. It was Coggan's watch striking the hour of two. Oak went to the recumbent form of Matthew Moon, who usually undertook the rough thatching of the homestead, and shook him. The shaking was without effect. Gabriel shouted in his ear, "'Where's your thatching beetle and rick-sticks and spars?' "'Under the staddles,' said Moon, mechanically, with the unconscious promptness of a medium. Gabriel let go his head. It dropped upon the floor like a bowl, and then he went to Susan Tall's husband. "'Where's the key of the granary?' No answer. The question was repeated, with the same result. 
To be shouted to at night was evidently less of a novelty to Susan Tall's husband than to Matthew Moon. Oak flung down Tall's head to the corner again and turned away. To be just, the men were not greatly to blame for this painful and demoralizing termination to the evening's entertainment. Sergeant Troy had so strenuously insisted, glass in hand, that drinking should be the bond of their union, that those who wished to refuse hardly liked to be so unmannerly under the circumstances. Having from their youth up been entirely unaccustomed to any liquor stronger than cider or mild ale, it was no wonder that they had succumbed, one and all, with extraordinary uniformity, after the lapse of about an hour. Gabriel was greatly depressed. This debauch boded ill for that wilful and fascinating mistress, whom the faithful man even now felt within him as the embodiment of all that was sweet and bright and hopeless. He put out the expiring lights, that the barn might not be endangered, closed the door upon the men in their deep and oblivious sleep, and went again into the lone night. A hot breeze, as if breathed from the parted lips of some dragon about to swallow the globe, fanned him from the south, while directly opposite in the north rose a grim misshapen body of cloud, in the very teeth of the wind. So unnaturally did it rise that one could fancy it to be lifted by machinery from below. Meanwhile the faint cloudlets had flown back into the southeast corner of the sky, as if in terror of the large cloud, like a young brood gazed in upon by some monster. Going on to the village, Oak flung a small stone against the window of Laban Tall's bedroom, expecting Susan to open it, but nobody stirred. He went round to the back door, which had been left unfastened for Laban's entry, and passed in to the foot of the staircase. "'Mrs. Tall, I've come for the key of the granary, to get at the rick-cloths,' said Oak in a stentorian voice. "'Is that you?' said Mrs. Susan Tall, half awake. "'Yes,' said Gabriel. "'Come along to bed, do, you draw-latching rogue, keeping a body awake like this.' "'It isn't Laban, tis Gabriel Oak. I want the key of the granary.' "'Gabriel?' "'What in the name of fortune did you pretend to be laving for?' "'I didn't. I thought you meant—' "'Yes, you did. What do you want here?' "'The key of the granary.' "'Take it, then. Tis on the nail. People come and disturbing women at this time of night ought—' Gabriel took the key, without waiting to hear the conclusion of the tirade. Ten minutes later his lonely figure might have been seen dragging four large waterproof coverings across the yard and soon two of these heaps of treasure in grain were covered snug, two cloths to each. Two hundred pounds were secured. Three wheat-stacks remained open, and there were no more cloths. Oak looked under the staddles and found a fork. He mounted the third pile of wealth and began operating, adopting the plan of sloping the upper sheaves one over the other, and in addition filling the interstices with the material of some untied sheaves. So far all was well. By his hurried contrivance Bathsheba's property in wheat was safe for, at any rate, a week or two, provided always that there was not much wind. Next came the barley. This was only possible to protect by systematic thatching. The time went on, and the moon vanished not to reappear. It was the farewell of the ambassador previous to war. The night had a haggard look, like a sick thing and there came finally an utter expiration of air from the whole heaven in the form of a slow breeze, which might have been likened to a death. And now nothing was heard in the yard but the dull thuds of the beetle which drove in the spars, and the rustle of thatch in the intervals. End of chapter 36